and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from the NTV newsroom here at the Nation Centre. Now, as many of you may know, NTV Wild Talk premiered at the beginning of February of 2016. So it's almost been an entire year of programming where we've brought you wildlife and conservation issues. And it's been a seriously amazing journey for everybody involved, from the team at Wildlife Direct, our partners, and KWS, our partners too, and the team right here at NTV. So since we're approaching the end of the year, we thought, why not look back at some of the best episodes that made up 2016? Now, I've got to say, it has been really difficult narrowing down because there are so many favorites. We've covered some incredible stuff, but we had to choose a few for this show. So here are some of my personal favorites. Now, we kick off with our very first episode that aired on the 3rd of February 2016. This has got to be a special one because it really did set the tone and the agenda for NTV Wild Talk. It was titled Mystery of Mzima, and we went out to Savo West to the Mzima Springs out in the fresh air to bring you that show. Now, what was so special about this is that it was a refreshing feel and we covered some serious issues from the near death of the Mzima Springs to the revival of it and various other issues surrounding it. So many Kenyans didn't even know that Mzima Springs existed. Have a look at this amazing show. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. It's so great to have you here. Mark, you are the man behind Mzima, Haunt of the River Horse. It's great to have you here. And the documentary aired on NTV a couple of weeks ago and it received a huge positive reaction. There was um, comments about why has it taken so long for us to see documentaries like this. Many people thought that this was filmed not so long ago. I in fact, it was filmed um, at the beginning of, of 2000, so 15 years ago. And at the time, I mean, the amazing thing was we couldn't get it shown in Kenya. You know, we, had, we, we held back the Kenyan rights because we thought it's important that people see these sort of films in the countries in which they're made, but nobody wanted to, to show it. And in fact, you know, it got to the stage where we were being asked for money to show the film. And what's fantastic now is that actually, you know, with this initiative and NTV coming along, then we have a chance, you know, we have a platform to show the film, which we've never had before. And why do you think nobody wanted to show it back then? I don't know. We were being told that Kenyans weren't interested in wildlife. You know, it, it just wasn't, people weren't visiting the parks. And we said, look, p people haven't been exposed to, to wildlife. They haven't seen this sort of film, which, you know, with our films go out probably in 170 countries around the world and they get you know 600 million people see them and yet the shame was that it was never being shown here. But in many ways it's, it's quite a unique setting if you want to make a film about hippos. Um, it's very very special indeed and this has been recognized for some time and um, I think it's one of the more uh, more known, uh, iconic places uh, for watching hippos. Well, Dr. Leakey, having said that, the ecosystem has changed 15 years later. We've had a walk around here, and although the water level remains the same, there is a significant difference, and that is the number of hippos. Back when Mark filmed, I believe there were about 70 or so hippos in, in Zima Springs. Now there's only about a handful. What happened? They died, they disappeared, they um, were stressed by drought and possibly under stress disease. There was no food and they perished. Uh, this is how nature works, but in this case, as we'll discuss later, it needn't have happened quite the way it happened. And this was back in 2009? 2009, I was um, not involved at the time, but it was a drought that affected, first of all, hundreds of thousands of domestic animals. And there's a connection between that and the fact that Mzima basically could no longer support 70 hippo, which are entirely herbivorous. O'Brien, uh, Captain, the ecosystem 15 years later has not recovered. Is it a potential solution to reintroduce hippos from elsewhere into Mzima Spring? 
every year the rainfall changes. Every year the rainfall comes lower and lower, not like the other years before. Mzima, as you can see, it's lava, it's rocks and everything else. It's, and I think it gets less rain than any other place in, 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 uh, in the parks here. So it means what was there last year is not what is there this year, and it has to be less the other years. So the hippos here must have been affected mostly because of the feed. The feed is not coming up, it's actually going down, down, down. And uh, with other forces coming up, um, for, you know, coming on top of this, more animals, more this, then the, the hippos will, 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 will actually have a um, bigger problem. But yes, um, the hippos are growing in numbers now. And uh, we believe that, um, you know, with some science, if we think of introductions, the rest, this can happen. There's no question hippos can be reintroduced. And, and, and let me say one thing. The ecosystem hasn't collapsed. I mean, the trees, the birds, the butterflies, the antelope, that's part of the ecosystem. The specific uh, relationship between fish, hippo excreta in this swamp and spring has dramatically altered. Now, this is how nature proceeds. Uh, different things cause changes in the environment and different things then respond in different ways. And, and, and what is very clear, it's, it's a wonderful a textbook example of, of how we cannot assume that if we put a fence around a nature reserve or a national park and we stand back, that it'll always be the same. Right. It's always changing. And if we want to maintain a diversity of species, then clearly um, we've got to have active management. And Mazima will come back for hippos. They can be introduced very easily. We've just got to get it right that we don't introduce hippos um, that carry disease um, and, and we've got to get the sex ratios right. But I'm sure we can have hippos back, but we need to be quite sure that if we do come back, bring in some breeding groups, that they don't die again from the same cause, and we'll get back to that. I think what's, what was immediately obvious when I went down and into the, the viewing chamber, the underwater viewing chamber yesterday, was that last time I was here was 2009. It was the height of the drought, and hippos were coming out of the water, and they were, were dying on the bank. They were literally collapsing on the, the paths that people you know, walk around the springs. And was this the first time that you came back to Mzima after filming? It was, yeah. And, it, it, and you know, I looked around, and it, okay, the actual mortality, the hippo situation was, was tragic. But then you look at look underwater then, and it didn't look any different. But what's happened in the years subsequently is that all the, the fish that used to eat the hippo dung, the fish that used to clean the hippos, the birds that then came and fed on them, the little insects in the dung, all their numbers have crashed. So when you look down now in the, in the underwater viewing chamber, you can see all those species are still there, but the numbers are very low. What are some of the other challenges that the park faces with regard to poaching and another potential threat that faces the spring itself? The pipeline. Already half of the water got, is taken down there. Now they want a second pipeline. First, the Taita people, they say this water is in their county, so they want the Mzima water. That means they want their pipeline to do irrigations and everything else in Taita. And he, still the government wants another pipeline all the way down to Mombasa. This is going to be havoc. Well, so the only thing I'm hoping, mm. personally, is that they don't get this water from the source where they were trying to get it. Yeah. They have to go down, maybe a kilometer or two down, because all this water goes and join, it goes into what they call Savo River and then joins the Galana River. Right. If they can tap this water down there, then it's safer for them. Mark, what impact would this have on the spring if it went ahead? If they took it from the top, I think it would be disastrous. If they take it from the bottom, I think it'll, it'll look like it is today. But people say, well, you know, if we take it down there, surely if there's hippos in the water, you know, the water's dirty. And absolutely not. I mean, we've camped down there. We lived here four years. And every day we drank water from, you know, in, including our small children, from the spring down at the bottom. And, you know, and they grew up. Well, they grew up. I mean, I'm six foot four. My two sons are bigger than me now. <laughs> so Mazima water, even if it's been through a hippo, is still really good water. This spot behind me is in fact where the majority of Mzima, Haunt of the River Horse, was shot. And while the number of hippos drastically declined during the 2009 drought, there are about five to seven hippos in the water, a couple of crocodiles and a number of fish. A real indication that the ecology of the spring is on the road to recovery. It's also a reason for you to visit Mzima Springs here in the Sabo West National Park and a reason to remember that we must never take our wildlife for granted.
So from the fresh waters of the Mzima Springs, we then went and covered a show about some tiny, tiny creatures, insects. Yes, so now when Paula, my producer, told me that, Smriti, we've got to do a show on doodoos, I really, really questioned her and I thought, Paula, are you sure we can do a whole 45-minute show on insects? I mean, really, how important are they? And she just told me, you've got to meet this entomologist, that means a man who actually studies insects, called Dino Martins, and he'll shock you. And I've got to tell you, I was amazed. We went to Laikipia to an area called Mpala, and we embarked on a doo-doo safari. It was pretty much like a safari where you go see lions and leopards, but we went on a safari to check out insects. And what this show really taught me was that everything on this planet really is here for a reason. All right, Dino, <laughs> I'm ready for this safari, but it looks like you've already started. Absolutely, because the, the insects have woken up this morning. It's a beautiful sunny day here in Laikipia. And we've got a wonderful uh, example of insect diversity on this flowering, whistling thorn tree. As we're standing here on the savannah, we know there's lots of mammals and lots of birds, but the real engineers and the real keystone species of this habitat are the insects. How are we going to explore and what's this safari going to be about? We are going to catch lots of bugs. Okay. Um, I promise they won't bite and sting you too much. <laughs> too much, okay. <laughs> I'm going to have you help me in a moment to shake this tree. But you can see right here just this uh, yeah. blister beetle has just landed on me. Wow. Okay. And this is a very interesting group of insects. The blister beetles are named blister beetles because they produce a very special substance called cantharidin uh -huh. which is being used medicinally and being used for all sorts of strange things including for a substance called spanish fly you might have heard of that I haven't. so it's an aphrodisiac <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it's made from these little guys. Really? Yes, that is, yeah. Oh, and there yeah, it's flown yeah, off. Gosh. It, yeah. But it's interesting that that is actually a beetle because um, when it flies off, it looks like yes, a bee. It does. And what's very interesting about insects is they're extremely diverse. Mm -hmm. In, a, in their simple bodies, which consist of a head, a thorax, an abdomen, and six legs, as we all know from yeah, primary school, yes. in that simple design, you literally have millions upon millions of variations mm -hmm. in terms of adaptation and also in terms of the role that they play in the ecosystem. So many people are familiar with this species. It's called the whistling thorn. You can see here, as we're disturbing the tree, yeah. out come the ants. And these are the cocktail ants. In fact, this one is a very special ant called the red-headed cocktail ant. And I can actually see that they do have red heads. They do. And they're called cocktail ants, not because they like to drink cocktails, <laughs> but because they tip their abdomen up, they cock their tails okay. when they're angry, which they're very angry right. now because we're opening up their, their home. Okay. I'm going to cut open one of these thorns. Okay. Here. Oh, ouch. They're getting into my clothes, which is always <laughs> what happens. So. This looks like a good thorn. Oh yeah, this is going to have a lot of ants in it. And sorry to open up your house, but <laughs> we want to see what you're doing. Oh, oh wow! Look at that. So what? So is there's that? an entire there's an entire Ooh. ecosystem inside the thorn. Yeah, and now all over your and hand. they're all over me, <laughs> and you can see, and they are biting quite hard. Oh wow! But here, we've tipped them in the, in the box. Okay. And what you can see there are their larvae and yeah. their nests. Oh gosh, yes. And they pour out all over you. Sorry, they're in my hair and my ears now. Oh wow, this is <laughs> amazing. So the white bits in this. Those are their young. And so what is remarkable about ants is ants live in a family, uh -huh. just like humans do. But it's a very different family. It's a family made up of sisters. Really? So these are all sisters. How do you know that? They're all sterile and they're all workers. There are no males. Males play a very limited role in the world of ants. Wow. And all sisters working together, cooperating. Girl power. Girl you know? power. Daughters of the queens, who, the queen who lives in this tree. And all very closely related.
So this is a termite that lives in this, this kind of soil that basically from here, if we were to dig underground, we'd go quite far down and find that. So Dino, are you essentially not just breaking their house? I'm trying to open it up to see if we can find a few of them, but it is quite hot and dry at the moment, so we may not. Um... They are what we call ecosystem engineers. And if you think about a termite mound, it, it lasts for decades, for hundreds of years. In some cases, for thousands of years. Really? We have termite mounds in Africa that are thought to be two to 3,000 years old. Gosh, that's fascinating. And in theory, because they have a queen who lays eggs right at the bottom of this mound, they can replace their queens and they could keep the mound going forever. And what termites are doing is really, really important because they are taking this dry plant matter that's all around us. Yeah. Almost all the energy and nutrients in this ecosystem is locked up in this tough fiber that even when herbivores eat it, they only partially digest it. Okay. And termites do that last vital step of breaking this stuff down and releasing the nutrients back into the soil, back into the ecosystem. Uh, this is a cactus, Dino, but uh, you said that you'll show me some insects. I don't seem to see any. <laughs> there are actually thousands of insects right here in front of us. And this cactus is an invasive species. It's not part of the natural vegetation. And on it, you can see all these fluffy little white things. Those are insects. Wow, so you're telling me that these all over here are insects. It, for me, it really looks like that's fungus. It, it, it does look like a fungus, but it's an insect. It's actually the female insect of something called the cochineal bug. And this is a wonderful example of how insects, not only do they keep the world running, but they also help us clean up the mess that we make when we move species like this cactus around the world. So the cactus comes originally from Central America and the, in this environment it, it thrives, it takes over the rangeland, it grows on these copies, it pushes out the natural vegetation, it suppresses grass, which is something that animals need and livestock need. So the cactus is a big problem. And the cochineal bug in its native habitat in Central America and Mexico is what naturally feeds on it. And so we've had this insect introduced to East Africa as a form of biological control. She doesn't need to move around. She's lost her legs and all she is is basically a mouth part, a stomach and an ovary. So she can feed and digest the nutrients and produce eggs. And I'm going to pick one off the cactus just now. And you can see what as I squeeze her, you see the red thing that comes out of her body. And that is... It actually is, also looks like cotton wool. It does. And this is something that has been, was widely expo exploited. And if you give me your hand for a second, okay. <laughs> I promise sure. that this won't hurt. Uh, so this is pure carminic acid that gives, that is produced by the insect as a form of defense against being eaten. And this color was harvested in Mexico as a dye. Really? And it was, it was a secret. The, Mexicans, the um, different civilizations that were there had figured out how to do this. And when the Spanish first arrived in Mexico, one of the things they took back to Europe was this dye. And it ended up building the wealth of the Spanish empire. Oh. Because at the time in Europe, nobody had such a beautiful, rich, deep color. Okay. And that's one of the reasons all the royalty in, in Europe wear robes that are red because of the carmine and the trade that came out of it. Who would have thought? <laughs> yes. That is absolutely yes. fascinating. Yeah. In addition to producing this beautiful color, which can you imagine a, a dress or lipstick in that shade, the, the bug, I'll pick up another one here, let's get another female, is also used as a source of food coloring. So you can see here that the f red food coloring is m still made today from this insect. 
So really, I've got to tell you that my crew and I have a whole new appreciation for insects. They excite us, we're able to identify them. And that night, I had one insect crawling across my bed and ordinarily I would shoo it off. But that night I thought, ah, there it goes, getting on with its business, I'll just leave it be. So really, we must respect every living organism on this planet. All right, so from insects to something else that was amazing. And these were the baby elephant orphans at the David Sheldrick Elephant Trust here in Nairobi. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may have visited. We wanted to highlight the work that goes on there. We showed the keepers who dedicate their lives to looking after adorable baby elephants. And we told the story of these elephants. And it was such a touching show because we learned that these baby elephants need so much love and care, just like a human child. And it also brought up a very key issue, and that is poaching. These babies are here at the David Sheldrick Elephant Trust as a result of the massacre that goes on across the country. Their mothers have been killed and the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust has rescued them. This is their story. I'm now standing in front of what's called a stocket. It's where some of the baby elephant orphans here at the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust sleep. They are now awake and they're heading out for their morning walk and we're about to join them. Peter, hi. How are Hello. you? Awesome, thank you. This is Peter and he's one of the keepers. We're going to hear a lot more from Peter in just a moment, but first let's get these elephants out. So Peter, who's this baby elephant? He's Kamok. Kamok. And how old is he or she? Kamok is now two years. Okay, two years old. Kamok is coming out of its stocket and ready for its walk. There we have Kamok. He's curious as to who I am, where I'm coming from. A bit naughty. <laughs> A little bit naughty, says Peter. And who's this one? Watayoni. Watayoni. Wow. This really is a very special experience. And might I add that um, <laughs> we are getting exclusive access to see and feel and talk to these baby orphaned elephants. Well, well. This baby is very new, but uh, he has some broken uh, joint, the knee joint of the hind oh, or leg is broken. No. Probably from gunshots, from poachers. Really? Yeah, you can see it's completely me... swollen. Oh, yeah. You cannot see it quite clearly. Yeah, I can yeah, see yeah, yeah, yeah. the elephants. And what, what's this elephant's name? Lugard. Lugard. I can see Lugard as uh, he bends down. Um, his hind leg yeah. is broken and it looks really, really sore. And I also noticed that Lugard seems a little bit needy. Does he ever get out of this um, stocket? No, Lugard is always in there because we cannot take him out to join the rest because we don't want him to put more weight on the broken joint. I see. And the reason he has to spend time in a very limited area so that the healing can happen quickly. So tell us a little bit more about uh, when Lugard was found. Lugard was found uh, some few days ago from Savo and uh, he was identified out by the anti-poaching teams who are based in Savo. Okay, and then he's transported back here? Yeah, then we had to go and uh, I yeah, lift him back here so that he can get special attention and also treatment. Oh wow. Look at him. Well, clearly Lugard really is a survivor. It's so unfortunate to think that he's in this situation with a broken leg, unable to come out of his stocket simply because the poachers had tried to kill or possibly did even kill members of his family. Yeah, and there you can see Lugard's 
is still holding high the leg. Yeah. And cameraman Fidel, why don't you see what's going on right in front of you? <laughs> that's uh, one of the elephants that's trying to reach out and is very, very Cowro. curious. Who's this? Oh, this is a Cowro. Now, the reason I'm blowing into Caro's trunk is because Peter told me earlier that uh, elephants can relate a little bit better if you uh, do that because they get a sense of your scent. So tell us Caro's story. Caro seems to be interested in us here at NTV Wild Talk. Kaoro was rescued from uh, Sambul and he was found down a water well. And unfortunately, he hadn't been bitten mm -hmm. on one of the tip. The upper tip of his trunk is cut off. Oh, okay. He was attacked by uh, maybe smaller cats like jackals are the ones who cut off the tip. Oh, right. When he was down the water well. So that's Caro's story. He was trapped in a well, but the majority, or at least a lot of the orphaned elephants here are actually orphaned as a result of poaching. Each ele elephant has its own face, like we humans. I can tell by looking their faces, but for a new person, it's quite difficult. <laughs> so I can always identify each from the look of their face. Wow, okay, gosh, that's so interesting. As a keeper, you need to be dedicated to taking care of the elephants, and the elephants will tell if you want to take good care of them or not, right. if you love them or not. They can read our heart, and wow. so we'll accept work with you or we'll reject work with you. And that's why in most cases, when we are recruiting, mm -hmm. the elephants will help us oh, do the really? recruitment they tend to like some people more than others. Oh, wow. And if a number of elephants uh, don't like you and don't want to be with you mm -hmm. and they're complaining while you're with <laughs> them, then we don't have a choice. <laughs> so it's a, a, a matter of dedication and, and not just coming to work. And certainly we do see this. Um, basically all these elephants here um, are your family, are Peter's family and all the other keepers' yes. family as well. And yes. as I said to Peter, we really do salute you and your team for the hard work that you do to protect our elephants. Thank you so much, we appreciate that. So those baby elephants really are adorable and they deserve all the love they can get. So if you've never been to the David Sheldrick Wildlife Trust or if you want to go again, just make a plan to visit. It really, really is worth it. All right, you are watching NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyalthi. This is our show covering the best episodes of 2016. And by the way, if you haven't had a chance to watch any of these shows, you can always log on to our YouTube channel, that's NTV Wild. The links are also up on our Facebook page, NTV Wild. And remember, you can contribute to the show on Twitter using the hashtag NTV Wild. Do stay with us, plenty more coming up after the break. Welcome back to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyalthi, coming to you from the NTV newsroom here at the Nation Centre. Remember that NTV Wild Talk has been in existence for almost a year, so we thought we'd look back at 2016 and bring you some of our favourite shows. So from the very first episode to insects to elephants, we're now taking you to another favorite and that was all about rhinos. We traveled to Old Pegeta and this really is a fabulous show because we got to get 
up close to some amazing rhinos. One of them was Sudan, the last northern white male standing rhino in the entire world. If you haven't visited Sudan, you can just head over to Old Pejeta. And we also got to meet Ringo the baby rhino who sadly earlier in the year passed away. But what an experience finding out about these rhinos and how they truly are endangered due to poaching. Who is this? So, so this is Sudan. Sudan is, is now referred to sort of globally as the last male standing. He's the last uh, northern white rhino male uh, left on the planet. That is absolutely fascinating. Can we get closer to Sudan? Yeah, you can. You know, he's a, he's a bit old. And he's blind in one eye on the other side. So as long as we approach him from this side, mm -hmm. and as long as we're just careful and talk gently to him as we approach him, we can get very close. All so right, if you want so to let's do that. come with me, just go ahead and just follow, the, uh, just follow Zachary and he'll show you how to, uh, how to do it. Sudan, hi. You know, you really don't realize the size of a rhino until you get up close like we are. This is Sudan, as Richard said, the last male standing northern white rhino. And he's here in Old Pajeta. How old is Sudan? Yeah. So Sudan is now 43 years old, which makes him very old for a rhino. So in the wild, you know, rhinos probably wouldn't live much beyond 35. Wow. So, so the fact that he's got to the age of 43 is, is pretty pretty impressive. He's doing well so far and there are two other northern white rhinos. Where are they and who are they? Okay so there's this where, where we are now is the uh, what we call our endangered species enclosure and it was originally set up for the northern white rhinos when they came here from the Czech Republic in 2009. Originally there were four, two males and two females. The male Sunni died just over a year ago so now we're left with Sudan plus two other females one is Nain, she's also pretty old. Um, I think she's 38, around about that sort of yeah. age. And Fatu, who's a lot younger. She's, uh, I think, around about 14. And um, where, so there where are three are they? in total. Why aren't they here with Sudan? Sudan, unfortunately, has got to the point where he's so old that he really he gets bullied by other, oh. other rhinos. And he's a little bit shaky on his pins. You can see his back legs, back legs are uh, sort of sitting back on their pastons. So he's, yeah. you know, he's an old man. And really, um, he can't, he needs to be kept a little bit segregated and a little bit sort of nurtured by himself. Um, he's become friends with a young rhino called Ringo. Who will meet um, later. Who's a southern white rhino. Right. Um, and so he's got the company of another rhino, um, which psychologically is obviously good for him. Of course. Uh, Richard, tell us, it is just shocking to learn that there are only three northern white rhinos left on the entire planet. How did we get to this tiny number? Yeah, you know, it's... Um, it's an absolute tragedy that these rhinos would have been quite nu numerous ac across sort of Eastern and Central Africa as recently as 20 or 30, possibly 40 years ago. Um, the reason their numbers have diminished to the point that they, they're, they're, there's only, only three left is because of poaching for their horn. So rhinos across Africa and across other parts of the world, such as the Far East where rhinos exist, are all threatened for the same reason. Uh, poaching for their horn, which is made of the same stuff as your fingernails, yep. keratin. Um, it has no medicinal powers whatsoever, but it's reputed in the Far East to uh, be able to cure various diseases and that kind of stuff. So there's a high price um, that, um, that people are prepared to pay for rhino horn, and that's the reason they get poached. Um, and that's the reason this animal here, or this species here, is on the brink of extinction. In order to increase this northern white rhino population, yes, why yes. can they not breed? I know Richard mentioned there had been challenges, but there is now a plan and... Um, uh, an idea to make a rhino. Tell us more about that. What is that campaign? Uh, that is a campaign, an online campaign to facilitate raising of funds to be able to, to, to fund or to, to support the program, the IVF program. So then the only option that there is, that, that there remains is in vitro fertilization. That's To IVF. be able to collect uh, egg cells from the females and sperm from Sudan fuse the two to form an embryo. This embryo will then be implanted in a surrogate southern white uh, rhino female. Okay. So then it is a very costly affair. It is a very costly affair. So that's, that's why we have the, 
make a rhino. There is already sperm that okay. was collected previously. Okay. Now that we have that sperm, what we do not have is egg cells from the two females. Okay. So the plan is to develop techniques that will be able to do the ovum pickup. That's the stage we are at now. So when we get to the ground and collect those eggs, we will get, go to a laboratory environment and, and, and mature the, okay. the, uh, the ovum. After maturing that ovum, that's when we'll do the IVF. Gosh, so yes. a, a really complex um, procedure involved in trying to increase this population. But really now, uh, that will be possible only if the amount of funds are raised to do so. Uh, we certainly hope that that works out and um, we will no doubt be following up on that. But let's come back to Sudan here because um, I've noticed that his horns have been sawed down. Tell us more about that. Why is it like that? Yeah, this was previously done as a management practice mm -hmm. to be able to, to, to keep at bay poachers because poaching is a nightmare. Yeah. Poaching is a big disaster. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a war. It's like terrorism. Of course. It's the, the fight we are fighting is like terrorism. So then uh, trimming the horns facilitates, reduces the risk of poaching these animals. If you have only one male remaining in the entire universe, the last male standing, a subspecies of the northern white rhino. And then you need to take measures that will ensure protection to its optimum. So that was a management tool. And as you can see, it's growing back. Who is this baby? This is Ringo. Ringo is a baby rhino. It's a rhino calf that was abandoned by the mother six months ago. Oh, God. So our rangers, Zachary Yesogon and his team, they collected him. They, in fact, saw him abandoned by the mother, left lifeless, left for dead. They called the veterinary team in, called me in and some other guys. We went and actually saw that the mother had left. Uh -huh. And we, we examined, we saw that there's no way this animal will survive in the, in the bush. Okay. Then we are mandated by the Kenya Wildlife Service as part of the job to do to rescue orphaned and, uh, and abandoned right. uh, wild animals. We made a decision to take him in. So oh. once we took him in, we discovered that he had a medical condition. Mm -hmm. uh, what con was that? It was, uh, he was passing urine through his uh, navel. Oh, gosh. It's called persistent uh, urecas or patent urecas. Okay, can I, can yeah, I please, just try? Yeah, please, please go okay. ahead. Let me um, just, we'll carry on with that conversation in just a moment. <laughs> oh, Ringo, you're so cute. There you go. So, oh, bless. This is Ringo having his morning milk. This is such a fantastic opportunity. But uh, Stephen, Ringo is actually not obviously a northern white rhino. He is a southern white yes, rhino. Yes, Ringo is a southern white rhino. Oh, He's male, okay. southern white. And uh, we are hand raising him. Okay, but after how long will he perhaps be reintroduced with his mother? After three years, three to four years. How he, old is he now? He's six months old. Ringo, uh, you are... We will assess the situation and we will be able to gradually and progressively release him into, into restricted areas <laughs> like, like, like Sudan's area. Really? Yes. Stephen, before I fed Ringo, you were telling me about his medical condition. Expand on that. Yeah, Ringo, when he was abandoned by the mother and after we picked him up, after feeding him some uh, rehydrant, we realized that he was passing urine through his umbilicus, through his navel. Mm -hmm. So then this is a congenital problem. This is a congenital malformity whereby uh, the urecus fails to close. Urecus is a tube that connects, is a tube within the umbilical cord that connects uh, the bladder mm -hmm. of the f unborn baby, right. born the fetus, to the fetal fluids. So this, is, this passes the urine. So how did this affect his relationship with his mother? So then uh, this, this is arguably could have, a, could have led to him being abandoned by the mother because we found him very weak, dehydrated, uh, could not move, meaning he was not able to suckle because of the pain uh, as a result of uh, what he was going through. So then uh, after consultations with the Kenya Wildlife Service vets, mm -hmm. we were able to uh, successfully treat this condition and uh, it closed up after two weeks of, of treatment. And how would you describe Ringo's health uh, at the moment? You can see it. He's... <laughs> he's doing well. He's doing well. You can just see it by the appetite. The, the bottle of milk, he's taken two bottles of milk. 
and he has a fantastic demeanor. We allow social interaction between him and Sudan mm -hmm. for that social enrichment and it's a good thing for both of them because then the only other enrichment he has is human, of course. which is not ideal. I've got to say, getting up that close to a rhino was a lifetime experience. Absolutely incredible. And I would do it again and again. From that show, back to elephants, but in a different perspective. This show was particularly memorable, not only to me, but to the world at large. We covered the burning of Kenya's largest stockpile of ivory. It was the biggest ivory burn in the whole world that took place at the Kenya Wildlife Service headquarters in April of 2016. Now this show was particularly moving because it was just incredible to be a part of those huge, huge flames watching that ivory go up in smoke and ultimately be destroyed. What it really meant was that the government was showing their commitment to stop poaching, which really, really is a big crisis across the country. It was extremely emotional for many, including me. Have a look. What you're seeing behind me are ivory towers up in flames here at the Nairobi National Park. 105 tons of elephant ivory, 1.35 tons of rhino horn, animal skin, sandalwood and also prunus africana, that is a bark, have been set alight. The smoke is billowing up in the air, the flames are roaring behind me. What this represents are dead elephants and dead rhinos. But all this was the order of President Uhuru Kenyatta last year that Kenya must burn her ivory stockpile. It is the biggest stockpile to go up in flames and the point of burning this ivory was to send a strong message to the rest of the world that Kenya does not value ivory unless it is on a live elephant or rhino horn on a live rhino. Before the president set these pyres up in flames. He made some stern remarks about some of the biggest threats, poaching and the illegal wildlife trade. The last decade or so has seen catastrophic destruction of the African elephant. A new generation of poachers armed with new weapons and connected to vast new markets across the world threatens to exterminate them. In destroying the ivory, we reject once and for all those who think that our natural heritage can be sold for money. Evidently, today's burning does not in itself end this murderous trade. But if we combine it with aggressive enforcement of laws already on our books, with effective control over the movement of ivory and with attack, other attacks on the incentives to market it, then our elephants will be saved and this is as simple as that. How does that make you feel as Cabinet Secretary for Environment? Because this falls under your docket. Yes, I mean I feel very satisfied, you know, because when the President issued that directive, he issued it to me and I had to deliver and I have done so. We've issued a very strong statement today that the only value ivory has is on a living elephant. That the only value a rhino horn has is on a living rhino. We've issued that statement today. What we want the world, and particularly those countries that use ivory, to understand that ivory has no economic value. That's what we want them to understand. What next for KWS in terms of the work that now needs to start? We post the ban now. We are going to continue with our advocacy. I think uh, the message to poachers and illegal traffickers were very clear that they are under close watch. I am also happy that our laws now are punitive and uh, we won't see people arrested now. We are calling upon our judges, our magistrates to put people to life sentence when they, they, they trade in ivory and rhino horn. We also want to ensure that our sea and airport are not used to traffic. 
So the interagency collaboration His Excellency has called. I think it's very important. We need to enhance our screening, our dog units at the sea and airports so that our ports are not used to traffic these contrabands. And if we arrest them, we are going to put them in, in prison for life. It's two days since the burn here at the Nairobi National Park and the fire is still burning, albeit not as much. Robin Hollister is the man on the ground. He is the coordinator of the burn. Robin, it's a very, very different site here today. Um, take us through what we're seeing behind us. Well, this was the bigger of the stands. This probably had between 15 and 20 tons of ivory, and you can see what's left. There's, it's just fractured chippings now that, are, that remain. Um, everything that was on the upwind side um, on each of the towers obviously didn't burn that, you know, that well, so we've moved all that to these towers that we're going to fire up now okay. um, to just incinerate the remaining sort of 1% that remains. And that's all that's left? Yeah. All right, let me just uh, reach out over here and it, it's safe to do that, Be right? Be careful, it's quite hot, but okay. still just pick up a food piece. All right, well that's, that's a slightly bigger piece, um, but yeah, if you have a look here, I mean this is, this is what the ivory tusk uh, looks like now. It, it's charred and some fractures and as fractured. well. I mean it's already, although it looks like a solid piece, it's yeah. actually already beyond economic use. You can't, you can't use this I and mean, if you bash it against something it's going to just splinter and become little fractured right, pieces. Right, because, because one might argue that some of these um, smaller pieces might be able to be used but like you said once once they're taken if if at all they were yeah, to be carved carve they would just be um, they would just fall into pieces wouldn't yeah, they? Yeah they'd be fractured so what any pieces like this that have um, are still big we'll just smash it with sledgehammers okay which is what we're doing here and it just becomes chipping so yeah, yeah. gosh I mean is, is this um, did it go to plan Robin because uh, just looking back on that day, 30th of April, these pyres were massive, full of tusks. It was an extraordinary sight. Um, did it all work out to plan? Because you've been working on this throughout the entire month. Yeah, no, it, more or less. I mean, the end result has worked out. Obviously, we had our, um, you know, sort of issues in between. We had two inches of rain, 50 millimeters of rain the night before. Gosh. So uh, everything was completely sodden. Um, which just meant that the igniting process took a little bit more time than initially. I mean, we needed more fuel to get it going. Yeah. But once it was going, no, the, and the end result has been good. I mean, that first night, I think we managed 75%, which I, was more than I expected. Okay. We're now down to about 1% left. Yeah, and, and I can see that. Let's, let's walk over yeah. um, to the pyre over here because Robin, I can see that on here, this pyre behind us, there's a lot of destruction. Um, but with this one ahead of us, the tusks still look like they're intact while they are charred, um, but they haven't broken down yet. These are the ones that we've actually moved from, you know, the various towers that, as I say, were probably upwind yeah. and, didn't, um, and didn't burn. So um, now we're just stacking them again concentrating them on some of the closer towers to the pumping station mm -hmm. and in a half an hour we're going to fire it up again and give it a good heating but you, as you know these are the pieces that that they look as if they're still a bit of a tusk yeah. but, oh wow you know it's actually oh. it just fractures it's no longer it just becomes tiny little pieces and it's yeah. certainly beyond any sort of use there really was nothing like that ivory burn. Being a part of it really was incredible. It was truly an historic moment. Well, that actually brings us to the end of this NTV Wild Talk episode where we've been highlighting some of our favorite shows in 2016. But we're not done yet because there are so many fantastic shows that we want to highlight that we're going to bring you a best of part two next week. So make sure you stay tuned. We hope you've enjoyed these episodes. And remember, if you've never seen them before, just log on to our NTV Wild YouTube 
page, our YouTube channel, and also you can get the links on our NTV Wild Facebook page and join in the conversation using the hashtag NTV Wild. From the entire crew, that includes the team at Wildlife Direct, the team at the Kenya Wildlife Service and the NTV Wild Talk crew here at NTV, we wish you a very, very happy New Year. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you again next Tuesday at 10 p.m. NTV Wild Talk, in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct.